and welcome. My name is Deborah Guffrey, and joining me today is Hazlitt Public School District Superintendent Steve Cook. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. There is no better time than at the end of the school year to do an interview about uh, public schools before you start. It's leaving. not over yet. It's okay. not over yet. Uh, so. You're back from spring break. Yes, yes. Summer's coming up, mm -hmm. and it's actually a really good time. No more snow days. No, jeez. Knock on wood. But knock, knock on tomorrow, wood. Tomorrow, although I hear it's supposed to be a little it's sketchy in the morning. So. It's supposed to be a little sketchy. You can't get through April without some sketchy That's winter That's correct. That's weather. correct. So some rankings came out mm -hmm. last month or, or so, the niche school ranking, rankings. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, the Oklahoma superintendent on talking about their rankings. And so the niche rankings for Hazlitt was number 17 in the state. This is out of 548 schools and number 24 for safest in the mm. state. So I wanted to have you come on, talk about um, that has the Hazlitt Public School District and, um, you know, some of the challenges that you face in increasing your rankings and continuing with, you know, excellent education, education for all. So. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, so our biggest challenge is obviously, you know, academic achievement is what we're all about. And we've been very fortunate to have um, very good uh, ratings over the years, you know, in terms of our academic achievement, um, mainly due to our staff. I mean, we, we really spend a lot of time making sure that we get the best and the brightest in terms of our teachers, our uh, para pros, all of our instructional folks who deal with students on a daily basis, uh, we make sure that we get uh, the best people, and that's really been, you know, one of our formulas to success in the long run. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at data. We spend a lot of time making sure that students are on track in terms of grade level and such, and so we use a lot of metrics in terms of. Um, testing and such to make sure we know where students are if they're not where they're at that we put in programs and things in place so that students get to be where they need to be and uh, it's a it's a team effort in every building district-wide and so like I said we've been very fortunate to have some really very dedicated teachers and ex auxiliary staff that really help us achieve that goal each and every year what are some of the changes <clears throat> you've seen or that Hazlitt's had to make in regards to program offerings, educational program offerings, um, in relation to the changing of, of time, you know, how things change in our community and in our world. Well, the online piece is, is probably one of the biggest things. We have a lot more students taking classes online, mm -hmm. uh, virtually through um, either a Michigan Virtual or through some other online academy. So the state now allows students to take, um, I believe it's from sixth grade through 12th grade, at least two classes online. Okay. So we do offer those opportunities to students. And so um, just making sure that we have the best online programs that are out there because as you know, um, you know some of those programs are not the greatest. And so we wanna make sure that if we can't offer that opportunity to a student um, at as a high school or at our middle school, that we have the opportunity to, to experience that opportunity somewhere else through a virtual class. And we do still have quite a few students that do dual enrollment. They need to go to LCC mm -hmm. or Michigan State University to obtain credit for a class that they normally can't take at high school. And those are generally um, your AP classes or your higher level um, science and math classes that they're not able to take because we don't have enough students that are taking those classes so we can't offer a full class so right. we offer an online opportunity or they want to take a specialized class like Chinese or something that we we not necessarily can offer through our regular curriculum so we allow them to take them online. What is the feedback <clears throat> you've received from parents in regards to online and dual enrollment with um, co with college credits. Well, it's always a scheduling challenge, you know, in terms of the dual room because students have to actually leave our campus and they have to go to either LCC or MSU. So they have to manage their schedule um, at the high school because they're also at the high school or middle mm -hmm. school in addition to that. So um, that's a challenge for them. In terms of virtual, it's just making sure that students um, stay on track because they don't have a physical teacher right. every day making sure that they're meeting their expectations and their growth requirements in terms of what they need to be doing every day. We do have uh, one individual who monitors um, each one of those classes or students that are doing online. So um, we have a good 
system in place to make sure that students are, are keeping up. The nice thing is they can get ahead, you know, and so they can, you know, manage their own time in terms of how fast they want to work through that particular class. So that does give them a lot of flexibility. Um, and then when they get to the next level, you know, it, it, it prepares them for that idea that as you get to um, uh, the next level in terms of college, you know, you don't get a lot of direct instruction. So a lot of things that you have to get are either through online resources or other opportunities um, to learn some of the curriculum. So it kind of prepares them for that before they get to the next level. Have you seen a growth in the number of students attending <clears throat> the school district? We have. We, I think um, at our high school we probably have um, over 100 students out of our 900 um, that attend has a high school that take a virtual class, okay. whether it's one or two classes. So, okay. you know, pretty good percentage, pretty good percentage. You know, it's, it's not for every student, you mm -hmm. know, so it just depends on, you know, your work habits and, um, you know, your ability to be able to manage your own time. And like mm -hmm. I say, sometimes that's good for students as they go to the next level because it gets them um, uh, experienced at working at their own pace and, and making sure they're managing their own time, which is really one of the big things that they have to do at the next level. So, What about diversity and inclusion? There's a lot of talk <clears throat> about that. You, you know, know. We, we try as best as we can. You know, we're not a hugely diverse community, but mm -hmm. um, we do have diversity in our buildings, and we work really hard to make sure that um, those students' are, needs are being met. We have a lot of um, clubs and activities. We do a lot of training with our teachers and with our staff to make sure that they're um, that they understand the idea of diversity and the uh, the needs of those students who are of color and that have um, uh, other expectations that they have within our within our school. But it is a challenge. It is a challenge for our district. Do you have extracurricular activities? We do. We have we have like at the high school we have other clubs. We have the Black Student Union. We actually Milton Scales, who was a former board mm -hmm. member here, um, was instrumental in getting that program off the ground along with our principal Bart Wojcicki seven eight years active. ago. Still active. Still active. Yes. And so um, and there would there again we've we've worked uh, we brought in. Um, individuals from Michigan State University to work with our administrative staff and our um, teaching staff uh, in the area of diversity and mm -hmm. um, what that looks like and how they can deal with it. Um, because like I say, when you're not a diverse community, it's a little more difficult. So, mm -hmm. um, But we are making strides to, to move forward in that area. You feel like you step up to have, reaching you know, out. <clears throat> we have. You know, unfortunately with school districts now, there's a lot more responsibility in terms of not only diversity, but mental health and mm -hmm. a lot of the th uh, things that kids are dealing with on a daily basis that um, they may or may not have been dealing with 20 years ago or when you and I were going to school. So, yeah. What about funding? Um, how has that um, strapped you, so <clears throat> to speak, and how have you found ways around Well, I will it? tell you, the last few years it's been a lot more positive than um, 10 years ago. Um, we've, for the last couple, three years, we've had increase in funding, and so that's been positive for our district. Um, the governor's come out with her proposal in terms of funding for next year, and it's very positive. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just the beginning, so the, the Senate and the House still have to come out with their proposals, and they kind of all three work together to come up with a final proposal that they can that they can get through both um, houses of uh, the Senate and and the state or um, and the House and the Senate. So um, this year it'll be a little different because we have a new governor, mm -hmm. so the whole pot on a lot of new legislators. So everybody's trying to get their feet wet and and feel their yeah. you know where they're at in terms of um, those types of things. So. Normally, we've gotten a budget in place before June, which is when we have to put our budget in place prior to the end of June. So this year, uh, we may not get a budget from the state until after we have to actually physically put our budget together. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of estimates. You know, we try to get a feel for what we think it's going to be and, and try to put something together based on that. But at least the numbers at this point are, are fairly positive, and they have been positive for the past couple of years. So, um, you know, Can you we're, share what some uh, of that is, what you're um, looking at right well, now? Well, so she's proposing an increase in the foundation allowance, which is our basic um, per student allocation that we get, um, an increase, and it's, uh, it's actually a... Uh, it used to be a two-time formula. Districts are at different levels of funding, so you may we're at the lowest foundation allowance, and there are other districts that are higher than us. And so, um, the last several years, they've been giving districts at the lower level more money than the districts at the higher level. And then anyone in between, it's a range depending mm -hmm. upon where you're at. So, what puts you at the lower level? Um, when Proposal A came into existence years ago, 25 years ago, they set the foundation allowance based on what a district was getting based on local property taxes. That's mm -hmm. how they developed the formula, and so they didn't want anybody to be uh, negatively affected. So what you, you saw a huge gap back then. So everybody 
had a minimum level. So if you were below that funding, you were, everybody was placed here, and then the districts that were getting more still stayed at that level. And over time, they've tried to, to lower that gap, okay. but it'll never get, you know, the Oakland County, you know, mm -hmm. the Birmingham's and Bloomfield Hills, and even on the west side of Kent County will never be what they are funding, but um, it's getting better, you know. Mm -hmm. So the legislature has done a, a good job at trying to, to equalize that gap in funding over the years. And there was a big study that came out um, a few months ago, I think Michigan State, or, uh, an outside organization, basically saying that schools are still underfunded significantly. So um, the legislature has been taking a hard look at, you know, what can we do to potentially um, restore some of that gap in funding uh, for schools. Um, do you think if you were able to see an increase in funding from <clears throat> the state that there would be a decrease and ask for from the community members and bonding proposals <clears throat> and such well, or is it just not just so, not enough so infrastructure needs are not met through state funding mm -hmm. so anything you want to do over and above general operations has to be funded through some other means um, mm -hmm. and generally it's a bond issue so mm -hmm. you have to go to your community to ask for that there's not a system in place at the state level to fund infrastructure which would be buildings and grounds and all that type of thing the air uh, you breathe inside the school yes, the yes. hvac the, system the, the, <laughs> the four walls inside a school building right. are generally funded through bond issues so every district is unique and has different funding opportunities right. based on what the community support is and quite honestly what their property tax base is so some communities are able to raise a lot more money because they have a high their property tax base so they can ask for um, they don't have to raise as much millage per household as a, a community with um, mm. a lot less ta property tax base so what has Hazlitt done with some of the bonding uh, well we money? just passed a bond um, last year so we're very excited about that we're in the first phase of construction starting this summer it's a, um, a project over the next three years so the first phase is going to focus mainly on the outside of the buildings so we're going to do a lot of work on our parking lots of so the infrastructure outside the building we're going to be upgrading our athletic facilities um, it's been uh, our parking lots alone it's been 25 years wow. since we've you know, mm -hmm. and if you've driven some of our roads, you know, you understand what yep. that's what that's like. So we it's have a, a huge similar, issue. <laughs> similar issue within our infrastructure, within our district. So the first year is everything outside the building. The second year is ever side, everything inside the building, which is basically updating all of our classrooms to to be equipped for the 21st century in terms of technology, furniture, lighting, all of those types of things that mm -hmm. uh, enhance the instructional um, progress or performance in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then the last year, we're just kind of um, finishing up on any of the projects that don't get done in the first year, uh, mm -hmm. first two years. So we're very excited. Um, uh, it's about a $33 million project in, in total over the next three years. We haven't had a bond issue since 2001. So it's been really? 18 years since we've done any major improvements in our district. We've had yeah. a sinking fund, which is separate millage that we can do kind of some things with, and we have done some upgrades over the years, but the bond issue is going to give us the ability to, to do some major upgrades. And you so still have the sinking fund? We do still have the sinking fund okay. in place. And really that when most... When does that is, expire? Um, we just actually renewed okay. that with our recent bond. Um, ten, ten year renewal? Ten years, correct. Okay. Yeah, so that allows us to do um, things along the way. You know, mm -hmm. So like I said, the, the general operations budget doesn't really allow for a new roof or a new boiler or a new mm -hmm. chiller or paving the parking lot or those types of things. So the sinking fund um, allows us to do those kind of preventative maintenance things that happen that you need to do um, in your buildings on a, re a regular basis. So um, most communities have now East Lansing, Okemos has a, most of the districts in the area have sinking funds that they use for the similar purposes. Is the per pupil funding or the future per pupil <clears throat> funding enough for the need for an increase in classroom size if you were to have student population increase let's say new, new neighborhoods are coming in being built well, we you know we get per student so as students rise you get yeah. more money okay that's fundamental is it enough that to works. cover well the, the study that just recently came out um a few months ago basically said we are underfunded i think to the tune of summer in the neighborhood of a thousand dollars per student so that's a significant amount um so in terms of growth you know that's always good for our district um uh, we do have two new developments, the Copper Creek that was just approved a few months ago and the Newton development, which mm -hmm. I inquired about earlier. Those are two possibilities of new homes, which mean mm -hmm. new students potentially in our district. And we haven't had a major um, development in our 
district in quite some time. So that's positive for the future for us. Um, and we do believe that we have the space needs for that if we do get an increase. Mm -hmm. So that's the challenge sometimes as you begin to grow, do you have the facility needs to be able to, to accommodate those additional students? And we believe we, we do because we've, we've basically decreased over the last 10 years in enrollment. We're um, not, not at a great rate, but you know, we are losing students. Parts are because birth rates are down and um, the total amount of students in our state has decreased over mm -hmm. the last 10 years too. So, you know, theoretically our district would go down too. So, um, How do you see the community involvement with the Hazlitt School District <clears throat> assisting in the success of the school district? Oh, it's, it's, our, it's our main reason for success is community involvement. I and mean, if you come to any of our events, even if it's kindergarten roundup or if it's the science fair or the art fair or any sporting event, you know, we have a ton of community involvement. You know, you go to parent-teacher conferences, you know, it's, it's packed, you mm -hmm. know. So parents are very, very well connected to not only their students but what's going on in the community. And that's really, I think, overall has been long-term, it's been the success of our community. And they supported us. You know, we haven't had a bond issue fail um, mm -hmm. in the past, and so that's you know mm -hmm. that tells you that our community is supportive of what we do, and they, and we try to be very yeah, and we try to be very transparent about that. You know, and so we're fortunate. You know, we're not a district that gets a lot of money, but we're still able to achieve the academic success um, of a district like Okemos, who who does get a lot more per student than we do, and so. Um, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to do that. And like I said before, it's really based on our, uh, uh, our staff, you know, their dedication to the job and to students in our district, so. Have you had suggestions from the community in regards to improvements and um, has we the always, school district been able we, to act on that? We do, you know, I mean, safety and security has been a huge issue, yeah. you know, over the last, you know, several years and even the last year with the, um, the recent shooting um, in Florida, so a year ago. So we've done a lot to, to enhance our security over the last um, year um, in all of our buildings, and that'll continually be a, a, a focus um, for our district safety and security is, is a big issue. So um, we've received a lot of input in that area, but you know we do receive input on all areas, whether mm -hmm. it's curriculum or athletics or diversity or any of those types of issues that are concerns for parents. And, and we try to address those uh, concerns as they come up, and I think we've done a good job um, over the years at you know maintaining um, a good community uh, involvement um, for a district. And how does the um, Hazlitt um, Foundation the, um, <clears throat> we have, yeah, we have relate and work with? We have a Hazlitt Foundation. Most school districts have a foundation. It's really a separate organization. They're organized separately. They're um, they're affiliated only in support mm -hmm. in terms of you know they're you know they have a five hundred one c three status and they raise money yep. outside of the district. But um, they've been very supportive. We've uh, we probably receive um, upwards of forty to fifty thousand dollars a year in support from our foundation that we use for various project grants. Um, they were instrumental in our latest upgrade at our Hazard High School. We redid our auditorium, spent about three and a half million dollars, and they helped us raise money and and uh, right. do some additional things um, for that space. So, uh, and they do a lot of. Um, grants for our teachers so teachers will say i'd like money to do the x you know either whether it's technology or do a specific program we actually have a shakespeare play that's coming in to perform for our students at the high school mm -hmm. um this month and so the foundation helped us support bringing that group in to put that's on cool. the shakespeare play for our um literary literary students in in the high school so that's, that's, cool. that's a positive thing. So it's just an example of what they have done for us. How can someone get involved or who, who do they contact <clears throat> if they have suggestions or want to ask you any questions? Well, they can, have, they can come and see me anytime. I, mean, I have an open door policy. I get parents that will drop in or schedule an appointment. That's usually the best way just because, um, you know, they'll make sure that I'm there. But, you know, I encourage people to get... Most of our uh, parents will get involved at the grassroots level at their building. So if you have a student at a particular building, you'll get involved in either the PTO or PTA or some group mm -hmm. um, associated with with the school itself. Or mm -hmm. if it's athletics, we have athletic boosters. If it's choir, we have choir boosters. Mm -hmm. We have band boosters. Most of the um, groups that support some of the programs we have have an auxiliary group that has um, outside support that they provide. And all provide. of this information's on? Correct, on our website, yep. All and what's those, the website um, address? Hazlitt, 
Uh, <laughs> this is the biggest stumper right here. Hazlet.k12.mi.us, I believe. But if you Google, Google Hazlet schools, Hazlet Public School gonna, it's going to come up. Yeah, and it's so you know, we updated our website a couple years ago. Um, it so looks good. So and we actually went to a new app for I our phone. That. Hazlet Public Schools has an app. We have we just rolled it out in January, and we have I think over fifteen hundred. Um, users That's now great. so it's another as we mentioned talked earlier it's another yeah. way to push out information to parents and you know people don't use websites as much as they used to mm -hmm. unless you have a specific need for that mm -hmm. um, so the app that we um, introduced a few months ago allows parents to you know um, report an absence they can add money to their school lunch accounts they mm -hmm. can they can um, see the homework schedules they can do all that stuff right gosh I wish phone. I had had that when my kids were yeah, in school so I needed that lunch account thing yeah, <laughs> they have access to our student management system so they uh -huh. can check their kids grades and homework status and all that stuff right through their phone so do you provide after-school care at, at Hazlitt we do we have a um, kids connection program can they pay for before and after can they pay for that through the app uh, too? i'm not certain okay um, i'm not certain but um it's such a nice convenience nowadays it is. isn't it, it to is. be able to pay for things through an app it is. So, makes life so much easier it is so um that's a nice new opportunity that we've um offered to our community and parents so anything else new that you want to let the people know about um you know we're always there's always something new going on. The bond is the big thing right now. Mm -hmm. um, actually, if you drive through our parking lot at the high school, it's all fenced off for the construction okay. vehicles to get to our stadium because that's the first project is updating our um, athletic complex at the high school. So, um, is there a way people can stay informed about the progress? Yeah, of there's a bond. There's a on our web page. There's a bond site that talks about all the activity that's going okay. on. Our blackboard, which comes out in May, which is our biannually report that goes out to the district once in May and once in August. We'll have an article in there about the construction and all the phases and what. And that's a print happening. publication that goes, goes out to, to the all homes. the community. Goes out to all um, households in Hazlitt Public Schools, whether okay. you have kids in school or not. So, okay. Um, and you know we have, like I say, we have each one of our buildings on our website has their own individual right. newsletter that you can access if you want information about a particular school uh, in general. So. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming Absolutely. out. Thanks I for having me. It's been fun. I know. I'm going to get on the app. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. No. No, you didn't because I love, you know, I love information. I'm an information junkie, so I appreciate it. And I'm yeah. sure people out there, um, you know, want to know what's going on with the school district, Absolutely. especially when they're passing bond money and, yes. <laughs> you yes. know, investing in the community. That's correct. That's so correct. thank you so yeah, much for Absolutely. coming out. Good to see you again. Thanks. <laughs> and I want to thank you for watching.